Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details. Welcome to This Medical Life Podcast. These are the stories of medicine with Steve Davis and Dr. Travis Brown. This is the story of chronic traumatic encephalopathy, CTE, part one. This episode of This Medical Life is, in large part, a thank you to the Royal College of Pathologists of Australia. On the 8th of November 2023, for International Pathology Day, the RCPA put together a presentation on CTE with a number of guests. And Dr. Travis Brown, you were mightily impressed, and I've been using the acronym, so I'll let you unfold. (laughs) What does CTE stand for as we launch into this episode? So this is chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So CTE is what we'll refer to it uh, as just a very quick abbreviation. But yes, this is a a topic I've had on my uh, to-do list for a while. Uh, And the reason is, is because we believe this is a a sort of a recent disease. But when you dig into the history, it's not as recent as what you think. The controversy surrounding this topic is very, very recent. Uh, last 20 years, this has been a really topical issue, mainly associated with professional athletes. We're talking contact sport, uh, and we're talking about risk prevention. We're talking about our understanding of how this disease progresses. So we're going to dig into the details of that today. And I think society's got a patchwork quilt in how it's responding. And in some sporting codes, they're doing better than others. And I was watching the Women's Big Bash League in the lead up to this recording and a ball hit the grill on one of the batter's uh, helmets and they had to stop until the doctor came out just to double check for concussion and all sorts of things and then give the green light to continue playing. That is a sensitivity that is pretty re- um, uh, recent. And this is something we're trying to grapple. I used to watch uh, cricket where helmets weren't even used. These were these were the days, yes. you know, 20 or 30 years ago, we just weren't worried about head trauma. Mm. Uh, and this is really important today. And the reason it's important is because we associate this disease with professionals or professional athletes, but it's not just professional athletes who are affected. And so when when I refer to this and I say, look, the general population are becoming more aware of this, but some doctors and health professionals are also becoming aware of this, but this is not new. And the reason it's not new is our understanding of this disease is, is, be, is beginning to grow and it's becoming more prevalent. But there was a really interesting article uh, in February 2023 in The New Yorker. It was called The Forgotten History of Head Trauma. And it was by, uh, or it was about Stephen, Stephen Casper. And he was a medical historian. He is a medical historian. And he was, uh, he was approached because they were having a court case. Uh, I, I believe it was about hockey, about head trauma and people actually sustaining injuries. And they were saying, how common or how far have we known about head trauma? And so he actually went through and started digging up all the evidence that they have. Now, he's the, the first recorded, like the medical recorded instance of acquired brain injuries and head trauma came from 1872. Mm. And this was in England, and this was West Riding Asylum, where they they saw people having what they saw was mental infirmary or or moral delinquency is what they called it. And they were diagnosed with traumatic insanity or traumatic dementia. Now, why is this important? It's, It's because it's in the 1800s. Now, this is a significant date. And this is because a lot of our medical understanding comes from this time when we really started to grow in our scientific knowledge. But this was also when sports were developing. And so when we're looking at it, a lot of our contact sports were being developed in the 1800s. And so if we look at rugby, 
rugby was the the date in the sand is is 1823 the first rugby match uh, happened in England and you start to see clubs being developed if you if you look back in the clubs you'll see you know established in 1870 and, and 1880s so these are the old school old school type yeah. uh, rugby clubs ice hockey was developed in 1875 Australian rules football was 1858 wow and when we look at the US, a version of rugby was being developed in there by the Ivy League schools between 1870 and 1890s. And so this is where players were just pretty much wearing, uh, there was no pads, they were just pretty much wearing a tracksuit and, and, and a stocking cap on their head. This is also in the days where men were men. And <laughs> you looked at me when you said that <laughs> with and, irony. <laughs> and the, you know, you pay, th- you, you play through pain. Uh, injuries were part of the game. And, and look, there was no protective gear at all. And concussions were not uncommon. Uh, as the editors from the Journal of the American Medical Association stated, a man thus hurt continued automatically to go through the motions of playing until his mates noticed that he was mentally irresponsible. And in 1906, the Harvard football squad recorded 145 injuries to their players. 19 of them were concussions. And do- doctors believed at this time this was due to a severe shake-up of the, the central nervous system. Uh, and, and they theorized that actually these people might have serious consequences later in life because of these shakeups, and they had this conclusion. Football was something that must be greatly modified or abandoned if we are to be considered a civilised people. Now, the landmark report for CTE is actually in 1928, And this was by Harrison Martland, who was the chief medical examiner of Essex County in New Jersey. He performed hundreds of brain autopsies and included some boxes. For some time, fight fans and promoters have recognised a peculiar condition occurring among prize fighters, which in ring parlance they speak of as punch drunk. Now, the paper he wrote, he did call Punch Drunk, and he documented 23 examples, and this was a mixture of clinical as well as autopsy cases of these findings, and these are some of his conclusions. Mild symptoms show a slight unsteadiness in gait or uncertainty in equilibrium could present immediately after injury. Severe cases, chronic changes, uh, cause staggering, tremors and vertigo. Marked mental deterioration may set in necessitating commitment to an asylum. And so this was what he noted with regards to some of the boxes. The people who were at increased risk were the the slugging type boxes, these large hits. But not just those boxes, boxes who were constantly being hit and knocked it down and getting back up. Now, it's important to remember boxing wasn't the sport that it is today. This was like a carnival sport, so you could actually have boxers in part of like a circus who would do several rounds a day, uh, having hitting, getting knocked down. This was kind of their job. And so there was quite a lot of disparaging comments about people who had this punch drunk syndrome, as you can imagine, crowds jeering and Mm. uh, someone who were disorientated or constantly disorientated would get nicknames. P. P. T. Barnum would be exploiting it. Yeah, absolutely. And and this was evident even mm. then. Uh, and and Martland believed that this tr- this tr- was causing trauma. Uh, these it caused these micro hemorrhages in the brain. And what he said was replacement gliosis. And effectively, what he's saying is he thought what was happening was small bleeds were occurring in the brain that would result in scarring. And this, this was the problem of the, the brain in these boxes. If we, sorry, the, the, just very quick, we were talking early 1920s, some of these, 1906, 1920, we're aware of this. Yeah. And yet it seems in our modern football codes, it's, oh, <laughs> suddenly 
It's new. Right. And this is where the progression of our understanding comes from. And not only that, a researcher by the name of Edward Carroll Jr. noted that this wasn't just boxers who were at risk of this. It was footballers as well. And so in 1932, the annual NCAA conference, now this is the US college football, college association that does all the college sports, had a doctor speak about the risks of long-term brain damage. As a medical man, it is perfectly obvious to me that certain injuries that seem to be rather mild when they occur may show up 5, 10, 15 or, or 20 years later and become very much more serious than first expected. This is particularly true of head injuries. Now, the sports that they mentioned in this was boxing and football. And so this was starting to already be known at that point in time. In 1950s, we actually gave this a diagnosis. It was called dementia pugilistica. Oh, wow. And so the strange thing about this, we knew it was associated with boxing, but... The literature really dies down at this time. There's not a whole bunch written about this. Is that the time when money started increasing? I I don't know. Possibly. Possibly. But there is interesting. In 1983, there was a congressional hearing on the safety of boxing. And they equated the amounts of like the blows or the hits that people were getting in boxing. And they said this is the same in football for, for the U.S., And this may lead to this punch drunk syndrome. And there was uh, editor George Lundberg in 1986, the editor of JAMA, wrote this. There may be a substantial prevalence of chronic brain damage in football players, but at this time, no one seems to know. One senses that the football enthusiasts, including the sports medicine establishment, may not want to know. And so the 1980s and 1990s onwards, we're starting to get professional athletes. So this is people's jobs. Particularly in contact sport, we have athletes who are getting bigger, stronger, faster. The hits are harder and more violent. And that is part of the allure of the sport. People enjoy watching that. We've we've always enjoyed watching that. And in 2002, Dr. Bennett Amalu, who's a pathologist in the US, performed an autopsy on Mike Webster, who was a former professional footballer. His nickname was Iron Mike, and he played for the Pittsburgh Steelers. (laughs) And Iron Mike had 220 NFL games, four Super Bowl rings, and was a Hall of Famer. Now, Dr. Amalu diagnosed Mike, Mike Webster with CTE. Given the history of all of what we've spoken about, this diagnosis probably shouldn't have been a surprise. But it wasn't just a surprise, it was a bombshell. Wow. This was where the whole sporting establishment turned and pretty much attacked the findings. That it was wrong, conclusions were wrong, this was incorrect, and the interesting part was Dr. Uh, Amalu thought the, the findings would have been welcomed, would have been, mm. oh, we can do something about this, and the opposite occurred. We've gotten better with time. I think sporting organisations are more receptive now uh, to our understanding. But this is what this podcast is about. What do we know about this disease? Because we know that this disease can start early uh, and we need to actually step in. Let's work out what we know about this disease and let's understand how we can prevent it. Renee Tuck is the sister of Shane Tuck, who was a professional footballer in the Australian Football League, the good old AFL. Shane played 173 games in the midfield for my second favourite team, Richmond. Um, As well, he had a brief career uh, after AFL as a professional boxer. Shane battled with mental illness throughout his career, but this became particularly debilitating near the end. In July 2020, Shane took his own life. 
Upon autopsy, Shane was diagnosed with CTE. He was only 38 years old. Now, Relay has lived the experience of how CTE can impact loved ones and family. This diagnosis helped provide answers to Shane's declining mental health. Renee's a passionate advocate in this area, keen to shed light on the disease and supporting other families who are going through loss due to this disease. And Renee's our guest on this Medical Life podcast. Welcome, Renee. Hello. Thank you so much for having me, gentlemen. Uh, Thank you. Now, Renee, in your journey, Hmm. when was the first time you ever heard about CTE? Well, it wasn't while Shane was unwell and it wasn't while we were fighting uh, this disease we had no idea about. I would say probably Danny Crawley's diagnosis. I know that mum was reading about polypharma as well and she went, I reckon this could be something Shane's got. However, it was so new then, it hadn't been as raised and spoken of. So it was something that you went, oh, that could be it, or and then back to trying to save this new loved one, really. But I would say Danny's was, for me personally, when it all started to come together. And then you saw patterns between Danny and Shane? Well, no, because I, I wasn't aware oh. of uh, what Danny was going through. I knew he'd, he'd taken his life, uh, and I know that there was a lot of there was spuds round, which was mental health awareness. So I, I've i worked in mental health and drug and alcohol in the past, so I just put it down to mental illness, suicide. Then the diagnosis obviously came out. And by that stage, I, I really can't remember the timelines, but Shane was just so unwell. He, he died in the first lockdown, and I can't remember how long before Danny had passed but the bottom line gents is we had no idea what CTE was as a family as a whole not a peep not a symptom nothing Shane was having auditory hallucinations kept having voices that were telling him to kill himself they were saying nasty things they were they were so present that it was becoming it was consuming him daily and we just thought, we're going to lose this kid. What's going on? He's never been unwell before. We just been together as a family. His wife was just saying, you know, he's really not doing great. We brought him back to Melbourne. I just thought, we'll, we'll get him right. We'll send him back to his family. And he, you could hear him sometimes having conversations, telling them to, you know, leave him alone because it was so distressing for him. And they eventually won out at the end yeah. of the day. We, and, and he, and that's why his brain was donated because his wife and my mother said, he's not going down with that brain. We need some answers. And by that stage, Danny's diagnosis had been out. Mum had read about polypharma and that's where the brain donation came from. When did it become apparent that Shane was struggling with his mental health? There were quirks about Shane. So he was very very dedicated to his sport and his footy. So so you could say it presented as OCD almost. Uh, the obsession, the fitness, the training, the needing to play well. We just thought that was his personality. And look, it, it is part of his personality. He was very much a goer, very much wanted to succeed in whatever he did. He loved his footy. He loved it. So. But there was there was ritually vibes starting to happen around things and what most people would allow as thoughts to pass about their game or what have you became consuming for Shane. So he never suffered with depression or mental illness per se. He was always ready to go. He would, you know, rip into his football or buying a house and renoing it or whatever he wanted to do. He'd just go and, and really rip in. So that's why we were confused with all of the symptoms as well. But as soon as we knew there was voices on hand, we knew we were in big trouble because it was so, so far from any kind of normal for Shane uh, or anyone really. There was just no diagnosis. There was um, schizophrenia drugs they gave him, antipsychotics, uh, the brain zapping, which is the electrocompulsive, electrocompulsive therapy, convulsive, 
Sorry. You got OCD in the other one. <laughs> um, and that just absolutely knocked him sideways. Really sick. Could barely even get out of bed. Said it hurt his head. Uh, it can work for some people. I've heard some great things, but for Shane, I don't know if it if it did any positive whatsoever. What impact did this have on his on his life, on his his family life, and his children? Catherine did a great job in shielding the kids as much as possible. They knew that Shane was really unwell. He was frustrated. He became frustrated. He was wanting so much to be a present person, a present father, um, and he couldn't be. So he tried to take his life in Adelaide, and this was when everything blew up, and that was 18 months to two years before his death. So mum and dad went and picked him up and said, look, we'll take him, we'll do our bit, you raise the kids, because Catherine obviously and Shane lived in Adelaide, mum and dad are in Melbourne. So the kids didn't really see the the daily ins and outs of his struggle, and he was very, very very mind strong. So when he could put a mask on, people were blown away when he died because he would just be so wonderful at masking it. And if you didn't know him, you wouldn't know. And he was exhausted after that. And then the voices would really kick in because he was so tired. And you could see in his eyes they were starting to die out. You know people that you love. You know when they're alive in their eyes. And his were just really breaking down. And now we know that that was the brain failing and starting to really basically rot away. So it it had effect on all of us. My nervous system for two years was ruined. Every phone call I had, I thought that was the one. Uh, I was trying to work and support Shane and took over our lives, but not in a negative way whatsoever. You do whatever you can for the ones you love. And if anyone had it the hardest, it was Shane, really, at the end of the day. How did the diagnosis of CTE help? Oh, I can't tell you how. It's so bittersweet that you're excited about a diagnosis like that, you know? But I remember the call and Professor Michael Buckland were on speaker and he said, I've got the results back. And I'm thinking, if he doesn't have CTE, I will never get over this. I will never understand. Well, sure enough, he said, he has CTE and he's got the worst brain I've seen in Australia. Wow. So Shane holds the record for the worst brain so far. And I have seen his brain slides at the brain bank and they're pretty horrific. So it makes complete sense now. So I think that gave mum and dad especially a real sense of relief. A, they didn't, it wasn't genetics. They didn't do anything. He was now at peace because there was an incurable disease in his brain. So he knew. He kept saying, the voices will never go. I will never get better. I'm doing all of this to please you guys. I'm taking the meds to sleep because I can't sleep, but this will never go away. And I'm like, yes, it will. We are going to do everything we can. And sure enough, with the diagnosis, I do wonder if he had the worst disease brain because he pushed through so long. I don't know that many people could, but Shane was very determined and while we were gathered as a family in Melbourne, he kept pushing for us really because I think he sort of checked out, knew he was going to check out at some point. We've just recently had the coroner release some uh, some findings into Shane's death with regards to AFL uh, football and how everything is being approached from your perspective, with from being affected directly, do you think we're doing enough about this disease and to try and prevent it? I think it all begins with knowledge and education. So you can't fight something you don't know about. You can't better a disease that is not being spoken about or educated about. What I was happy with in the findings from the coroner is that he has put forward he wants education for all players involved. That alone gives individuals the power to advocate for themselves. If they know that they have been smashed in the head and they don't feel well, they can speak up and say, I'm not feeling it, I don't feel great, and they can advocate for themselves because, unfortunately, sports are communities, they're going very quickly, you've got competitions, things are happening, especially the AFL. 
I'm not interested in attacking anyone. I don't think football, football is Australian culture. It's where my, my father played AFL, my brother, my cousins, my uncle, those kind of things. I love AFL as much as the next person. It just comes down to if people are understanding that this is a disease that takes lives of the strongest, fittest, youngest guy you've ever seen, then you need to know about that and you need to be able to make informed decisions or at least have professionals you can go to if you can it. And then you go, you go for glory on your weekends. You do whatever you choose. I would never take sport away from any community or be interested in that. But as I said, gents, we were fighting a disease we didn't know about. So how how can one expect to change when we don't know? There's an un- I, I did speak yesterday um, to someone regarding if someone's broken their leg on the field and they're waiting for a stretcher. I'm not out there kicking it and kicking it and kicking it. But these brains are getting hit and hit and you can't see it. Instead, you're hearing people say, get up, you're soft. That's pathetic. Why is he off? These rules, they're going to ruin the game. Mate, they're taking lives. Say what you like. Put your kid out there. It'll change your perspective. Talking of perspective, because you mentioned, look, you love AFL as much as the next person. Yes. And as the coroner pointed out, we need more education. Yes. Knowing what you know now. Hmm. Does watching an AFL game have a different lens over it that gives you pause when there are head collisions, but also hard collisions? Because as uh, Mr. Buck, uh, Dr. Buckland said, um, <laughs> a- any collision transfers to the brain. Does it? Correct. Do, do you do you see that changing as more people become aware of it, and it's not quite the? I definitely. Joy? I hold my heart sometimes when I see some some hard hits, especially when you see the the young boys get up and they're dazed and they don't know what's going on. I just think, oh, please take him off the game and then assess. No footy game is worth your life. So that side of things, yeah, it does take a different spin on it, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I know that it's the Australians love the biff and that's great. <laughs> so, and some, pe- and this is why research is so important because some people are susceptible to CTE. Others will box their whole lives and be fine. Like I, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really make sense. And, and it's so new here in Australia, where they're so informed in America, it's so far forward that American footballers are shooting themselves in the heart and saying, "Can you please check my brain? There's something wrong." So it takes years and years, I, I suppose, to get that out there. And that's probably all I want to use my voice for is because Shane's not here and I think he would say, go great guns, go hard, enjoy your footy, please just don't do what I did, keep pushing through when when you've copped a couple or what have you, you know. Just finally, is there any advice you have for families who may find themselves in a similar situation to you and your family? Stick together, stick together uh, and do what you can. Go to professionals, reach out, don't give up. Don't give up on your loved one because it's becoming more uh, talked about now and that is Professor Michael Buckland. He would like to see trials while he's still alive and, you know, it, you can still have a concussion and have post-concussion concussion syndrome without having CTE. So don't panic. I don't want the world to go and panic that every single hit's going to kill somebody. Um, but my advice is just really be careful and just look after yourself and advocate for yourself. And if that means getting checked out, even when you feel you're probably being over dramatic, you can't be dramatic enough when it comes to saving your life and your brain health. I think because my other brother, Travis, we had this conversation and he said, it's all right for you to say that, but men playing football don't speak out and say, I'm feeling this or that. And it also comes down to a position in the team too. No one wants to lose their spot. So there's so much to it and that's where if we just keep keep it alive, people can understand and, and things can come into place for people to go, all right, we'll check yourself, we'll work it out. Renee, thanks for sharing the story and the experience with Shane Thank here so on This Medical much. Life. Thank you so much for having me, gents. It's a pleasure. Mm-hmm.
Associate Professor Michael Buckland is a senior staff specialist and the head of the Department of Neuropathology at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital. He's also the founder and director of the Australian Sports Brain Bank, co-director of the Multiple Sclerosis Australia Brain Bank, and head of the Molecular Neuropathology Program at the Brain and Mind Centre. Associate Professor Michael Buckland is our guest on this Medical Life podcast. Welcome. Oh, thanks for having me, Steve and Travis. Michael, where did this begin? When did you first become interested in CTE? Uh, I'm a neuropathologist here in Sydney. So my job is essentially diagnosing and classifying disease uh, of diseases of the brain and, and spinal cord through examination of brain tissue. I see a lot of um, brains from autopsies. Uh, as well as uh, bits of brains from from surgical procedures. So I had been seeing a, a lot of brains for a long time, following the literature coming out of the US and thinking that while I see a lot of weird and wonderful pathology, I'd never actually seen the pathology they were describing. Um, and it, it took me a little while to realise that I needed to, maybe I should look in the at-risk population and uh, and maybe I would start to see it. So I, I started to try and find uh, people that had passed away that had, had played a lot of sport. And uh, I guess the, the gotcha moment for me was in fact the first person person's brain that I looked at that had been a professional footballer, uh, had you know first slide under the microscope, there it was, um, exactly as it had been described in the US. Wow. Uh, so that, from that moment on, I realised that, uh, that this was a disease that we hadn't been paying attention to um, in, in Australia and had probably been flying under the radar for many, many years and hence launching the Sports Brain Bank to try and chase down this, this previously uh, unrecognised disease. What is CTE? So uh, currently CTE is it's actually defined by the pathology rather than the clinical signs and symptoms. So it's quite a technical def pathological definition, uh, and it's defined by the accumulation of hyperphosphorylated tau in the brain, uh, in the cortex, around small blood vessels at the depths of cortical sulci, which are the, the valleys of, of the cortex. I'm sure you know tau uh, accumulates well, hyperphosphorylated tau accu accumulates in a variety of degenerative brain diseases, uh, including Alzheimer's disease, where it accumulates along with um, beta amyloid, as well as some of the frontotemporal dementias uh, and some more sort of uh, weird and wonderful diseases. We know that uh, a large number of people whose brains uh, were examined um, after the 1920s um, flu pandemic that had sleeping sickness. Uh, they ended up with a particular um, deposition of tau, as well as the um, Parkinson's dementia complex of Guam, which is a very r rare esoteric brain disease, mostly restricted to uh, natives of Guam, also characterised by accumulation of hyperphosphorylated tau. Uh, and interesting, those last two ones, even though they're weird and wonderful, they're also most likely environmental dis diseases. So we, we've actually got some historical um, uh, uh, evidence that, in fact, um, environmental insults to the brain uh, can lead to uh, tau accumulation. What are some of the symptoms that people may present with? What we know so far, it's predominantly been derived by retrospective interviews with friends and family members of people that have um, died and been diagnosed with CTE at autopsy. Uh, and it seems that there, there seem to be two overlapping uh, presentations. Often when CTE uh, de declares itself uh, in, in younger people, it will manifest as things that we would consider mental health problems, such as depression and anxiety, impulsivity, irritability, aggression, drug and alcohol abuse, uh, thoughts or, or, or even actions of, of suicide. Many of uh, the younger people we have diagnosed um, had had in life had been diagnosed with mental health conditions, uh, and as you may know, there's now a very uh, there's uh, Danny's round in the AFL promote men's mental health, 
because uh, Danny Frawley, who actually yeah. suffered from terrible CTE, was very public about his struggles. And, uh, and at that stage, when while he was alive, those struggles were with his mental health. I mean, now we know retrospectively that, in fact, he had an organic brain disease. Michael, just while you're thinking of the younger uh, patients and presentations here, with those symptoms, my uh, respect for GPs and specialists needing to be able to diagnose what it could be all sorts of depression caused by other things, very, very challenging, I would expect. If you go to the doctor, they'll take a social history, a drug and alcohol history, no one ever takes a sporting history. And one of the recommendations from the uh, recent um, position statement for the Royal College of Pathologists is that we should actually start including a contact sports history uh, as part of any standard medical history taking. Because I think if someone presents with mental health problems and they've played a lot of rugby league, uh, maybe you know, 15 years of rugby league, then that, that differential diagnosis should pop up. On, on any doctor's list. So you mentioned younger patients' presentation. Is older patients' presentation different? It seems to be. Um, th- there is some overlap, uh, definitely, but uh, and we don't know why in some people the disease will declare itself in someone that's in their 20s or 30s, while in other people it seems to mostly lie dormant and then uh, for, for decades and then declare itself when they're in their 60s or 70s. Um, But if it does declare itself in those older age groups, um, it often uh, looks a lot like Alzheimer's disease with problems with thinking and memory. Often there's more of a flavour of behavioural issues that go along with that Alzheimer's disease diagnosis. Uh, Certainly we've noticed in in the older uh, donors to the Sports Brain Bank um, uh, they often have uh, Alzheimer's disease written on their death certificate. Um, we're yet to see anyone with a death certificate that has CTE written on it or mm. probable CTE or possible CTE. It's very hard to do uh, large-scale epidemiological sort of studies um, uh, because uh, we don't we can't really confidently diagnose it during life at this stage. What causes CTE? That's the real red hot button question. Um, <laughs> you would have seen just the other week that the Royal College of Pathologists of Australasia, in their position statement, affirmed the findings of the recent Australian Senate inquiry that CTE is caused by exposure to um, repeated head impacts that presumably uh, give is, uh, lead to repeated mild traumatic brain injuries. To date, that's the only known causal agent for CTEs, exposure to these repeated mild traumatic brain injuries. Uh, It seems to be most commonly that that is through playing contact sports. Uh, Not exclusively though, we've seen CTE in uh, some cases of um, terrible domestic violence where there's been a lot of head injuries uh, over many years. Uh, and in people that have uh, very, um, very uh, drug uh, refractory epilepsy uh, that um, suffer from a lot of tonic-clonic seizures. Uh, again, but with a very uh, anyone that's seen a tonic-clonic seizure would understand that they may someone that has one of those may well experience some um, blows to the head and, and mild traumatic brain injuries. There is uh, a common perception that CTE is as- associated with concussion. Is that something we're finding in the evidence? It appears that the risk of CTE is most directly related to number of years of contact sports played. And it's not doesn't correlate particularly well with the number of concussions received. So it's not a concussion issue. I'm sure that concussions, are, as they are mild traumatic brain injuries, contribute to, um, to, to the risk, but... Uh, for every concussion you get, you're probably experiencing hundreds of other mild traumatic brain injuries. It doesn't necessarily have to be a head impact to have an impact on the head. Is that sound right? Yes, it, that seems to be the case, um, that uh, you can have impacts elsewhere um, that transmit force to the head uh, and the brain still rattles about in the skull. Uh, and it seems to be... Uh, 
uh, acceleration, deceleration events, particularly if there's a rotational component um, to that acceleration, deceleration. So a whiplash type injury where the head is not contacted at all can still give you quite a severe traumatic brain injury. Uh, so those sorts of uh, events seem to be very important. Uh, and it's likely that, yes, you suffer. There was one study recently that said that uh, junior football players probably had two or 300 of these events every year. Um, so uh, I think we're now about to see uh, the widespread um, over the next maybe five years, people starting to use instrumented mouth guards or little accelerometers behind, hit behind the ear. And we're going to get a lot more data about just exactly how many of these potentially injurious events occur in each in each match. Is the relevance of that uh, reference to even in junior sport where they've tried to reduce the physical collision of heads, but it's still other body contact where that transfer of energy is taking place? Is that the nuance there? Yes, you have to consider both of those mm. both of those things. With the impacts, do we know how many cause CTE? Is there a threshold that that people get to, or is this still yet to be known? Some people have had a, a bit of an educated guess, um, uh, and it's sort of the uh, sort of the dose risk curve looks eerily similar to the dose risk curves for um, cigarette smoking and lung risk of lung cancer. Uh, and as you know, it often that, that curve will start off as a very gradual uh, increase over years, and then often it hits an inflection point where it starts to rise much, much more sharply. So it it is a continuum, but it's uh it's not a linear relationship. Um, so some people have estimated it's probably two thousand, around two thousand of those hits um, uh, before you get a significant you hit that inflection point and the curve really starts to take off. I think that's a good first guess, but I think we, we need to understand a lot more. Do we know what sports are at risk? Any sport where there's large numbers of forces applied to the head. So the obvious sport, I think, is boxing. And as you know, CTE was initially described in boxes um, uh, and called dementia pugilistica or, or punch drunk syndrome. Um, uh, so boxing and other combat sports are probably the worst because, in fact, the whole point of that is to try and give your opponent a traumatic brain injury and knock them out. Um, and then the more physical contact sports, such as American football or, or rugby league, rugby union, Australian rules football, they're all quite significant in terms of their exposure and risk profile. Mm. Heading the ball in soccer also seems to be um, a, a risk. Uh, so lesser numbers of people have been described playing lacrosse. We recently had our first diagnosis here in Australia from an Australian lacrosse player. Others have, have said that uh, jockeys, professional jockeys, end up with a lot of head injuries. Um, we're yet to see CTE in Australia in, in jockeys. And there's probably other, other sports as, as well. That's all we've had, at least here in Australia so far. Looking at the brain, and I'm, I'm happy for you to go as technical as you want here because I was trying to work out the areas of the brain affected, I, uh, like specifically because I wanted to almost understand the symptomatology that patients are going through. Is there any area that is higher concentrated than others for this tau protein or is, there, is, it, a, is it a global disease? There do seem to be hot spots and we're actually just working on our data now to see if it's the same as... Uh, the US data in terms of what are the hot spots of the brain uh, that are most at, at risk. And so far, it seems there might be some subtle differences, but overall, I think the data we're finding is, is not that dissimilar to what the, they've found in American football, even though the sport of Australian rules football and rugby is quite different. Dorsolateral prefrontal cortex appears to be a real hot spot. Um, anterior temporal lobes are also probably the second most um, relevant uh, involved places and uh, inferior parietal lobule probably comes at, runs a close third. Dif different regions, but certainly dorsolateral prefrontal, which from my understanding is very much is involved in, in uh, concentration and planning and ta tasks, seems to be very important. 
I think also, and I, look, I'm not an expert, and I probably should know more that uh, that that impulse control is very much a frontal cortex fun- function as well. And as we know, particularly young men, the, the myelination and maturation in 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 frontal cortex often goes on up until their mid twenties. So it is a bit of a worry that particularly in younger people, that's a site of ongoing maturation throughout a time when they're actually being exposed to to injuries to that region. Is this something that is a stable disease or is this something that you believe is progressive? In the vast majority of cases, it seems progressive. Uh, uh, There are some people that have been diagnosed with low-stage CTE later in life where it seems to have been either very slowly progressive or, or stable over over many years. We've got at least one of those now in the Australian Sports Brain Bank. That's fascinating to to try and tease out why it didn't progress in, in these, these few people. Like most uh, degenerative brain diseases, such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, uh, we know, you know, as I'm sure you know, most degenerative brain diseases um, or neurodegenerative diseases are characterized by accumulation of abnormally folded and, and phosphorylated proteins such as tau. And it seems that many of these, including the tau from CTE and the tau from Alzheimer's disease, will spread in a prion-like fashion. As I'm sure you, you know, um, Stanley Prusiner won the Nobel Prize for describing the, the prion theory of a called Jakob disease, uh, where, and it, it seems that uh, these a- abnormally folded proteins, um, when they come up, interact with uh, the normal protein in the brain, they actually can can convert it into that abnormal conformational shape. Um, and it seems that that's how they propagate. And often I say it's a bit like zombies. I think if you understand zombies, you understand how prions work uh, because th- they're abnormal forms of a normal person and the way they spread is by meeting normal people and biting them and then those people turn into zombies so that that's how these uh, prion-like proteins tend to spread tau is just an abnormal protein that or or is it almost a uh, a generic term of protein in the brain that's abnormal or is this a specific disease process that we know about Oh, no. So tau is uh, a normal brain protein, and it seems to exist mostly in the axons, you know, which is the projections of of the nerve cells. And uh, it serves to stabilize the microtubules in those axons. So it's a very, it's uh, it's quite abundant in the brain. Um, But in, in CTE, it takes on an abnormal conformation takes on abnormal um, modifications such as uh, phosphorylation um, and uh, aggregates in the cell body rather than in the axon. And it's the same with alpha-synuclein and Parkinson's disease. Again, it's a normal brain protein that takes on an abnormal conformation and it seems to be able to catalyze other normal mm. ver- versions of it but into this abnormal protein. Do we have a feel of the prevalence of CTE in the general community? Because it can only be confidently diagnosed after death at at autopsy, to get the sort of population level data is is a huge undertaking. Um, Personally, I I think everyone that has any problems with their brain should have the opportunity to have their brain examined after death, but that's an expensive and laborious undertaking. So it's hard to know the, the prevalence. We know from uh, some studies of brain banks that co- generally collect dementia cases that um, it, it seems to be very uncommon in those brain banks. But um, there is there is definitely selection bias in those brain banks, just as there is with the, the, C, like the sports brain bank, in that they will take people with classic symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, that are, the doctors in life are confident that that's what it is. Or frontotemporal dementia, they'll say, okay, these guys fit the criteria. So they're the ones that get recruited into that, that brain bank. But what worries me is that, uh, you know, the average age uh, we're seeing uh, for all RCTE cases is in their 50s. Uh, so we have people ranging from their early 20s up until their 80s, but the average age is in 50s. 
most of those people would tend to be the people that drop out of life either through suicide or and and broken families often get estranged from families and no one's ever been looking at their brains and they don't even get counted as dementia or degenerative brain disease you know they they get listed in the suicide statistics and the mental health statistics so it, it's really hard to know i think in the general community uh, it's it's not going to be particularly common but in those people that have played a lot of contact sport, I think it's not going to be that uncommon. You mentioned suicide and CTE. Is there an association between the two? That is also hotly debated. I think there is a, a strong relationship between the two. Others have pointed to the fact that if you do sort of retrospective studies and see what's written on people's death certificates, if you look at uh, ex-professional football players, suicide is not written on their death certificate at any, any higher rate than the general population. However, these are historical studies. So uh, you probably remember, like back in the day, in, in say 1980s, I mean, suicide was still, there's a lot of shame and stigma attached to suicide. If you're someone with a public profile, like you were a famous footy player, most likely you're not going to have suicide written on your death certificate uh, because of the stigma around it. It's a really hot button topic and something we're very interested in. And we actually now have some funding to pursue that question and we think we have a good way of, of doing it. Great. Michael, earlier on, we looked at sports that might put uh, people at higher risk. What about in other aspects of society? Are there particular occupations or careers? or uh, Is there anywhere else where we can see uh, a greater risk of uh, a CTE? There's been a lot of talk about military veterans um, uh, and CTE. Uh, and as you know, there's a Currently, there's still a Royal Commission into suicide in, in veterans here in Australia. People expose, exposed to these uh, blast-type injuries or, or pressure waves from blasts, there is potentially a risk there. We don't have any good data on brain examinations in veterans in, in Australia, which is why we actually recently launched the Australian Veterans Brain Bank as the sister brain bank for the uh, Australian Sports Brain Bank to start trying to look at this. In the US, they did find CTE in some veterans, but those ones had played, also played contact sport. So whether or not it's a, it's a cumulative effect, most likely it's an, an additive effect. I think there's a spectrum of, of subtle brain disease. CTE is one aspect of that, but sort of chronic microvascular injury and chronic white matter damage without necessarily showing the pathognomonic CTE lesions. I think that we yet to still fully understand how that con contributes to someone's mental health and their cognitive health. So the only way to diagnose it uh, conclusively at the moment is is autopsy. Is there any early detection devices that are being investigated or show promise? Yes, there have been some um, uh, clinical uh, uh, criteria published. As at the moment, it's it's for research use rather than for. Uh, clinical diagnostics. But that's actually evolving quite quickly, uh, clinical diagnostics in at least getting a, a level of confidence of uh, you know, possible or probable CTE. People have also been looking at PET scans with some of the new ligands that bind to tau specifically in the brain. To date, that they have been slightly disappointing, those studies, uh, in that there, there seems to be a lot of off-target binding. You know, there's still a lot of work there and it may well be that the next generation of tau ligands will be able to to actually um, confidently detect and image that that distinct buildup of tau in the cortex. And, and Michael, just in closing this first interview with you, um, you mentioned another uh, brain bank for veterans, but the Australian Sports Brain Bank is how many people most aware of you and your work. How do you describe it? What is the Australian Sports Brain Bank? It sits within the Department of Neuropathology at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital uh, and is a collaboration between um, RPA Hospital and the University of Sydney. It's very simple. It is that um, people can just go online to our website, which is brainbank.org.au, and register their interest to donate their brains after death. When death occurs, and hopefully for most people registering today, that would won't it won't be in my work, working lifetime. Yes. We're able to retrieve the brain and process it 
characterize it, we issue a, a clinical diagnostic report. It goes back to the family. And then the brain is processed and stored in such a way that we're able to use it in research projects. And it's not not just our research. We're hoping once we uh, hit uh, a, a certain number of CTE cases at this stage, we're saying if we, once we get 50 brains with CTE in them, then we're able to get researchers from across Australia or even internationally are able to apply for tissue for their own ethically approved research projects. Wow. So the idea is that it, it empowers research by providing well-characterised tissue uh, to researchers. So far, most of the brains we've collected have been people reaching out to us at death. So when their loved one has just passed away and they then think maybe we should donate. And, and that's something we're very good at doing as well uh, in that. Because you, you never know when the call's going to come in. And then it's you know, drop everything and, and get this, try and get all the permissions sorted and, and the logistics sorted. But that's, we've become very good at that as well. That's essentially what it is. I mean, that's our core business. With increased funding, we obviously now have a, a database of many people that have registered their interest to donate, as well as registering their interest to uh, participate in research during life. So we're hoping in the next 12 to 18 months, we'll be able to launch some more clinical research programs through our donor base with that, you know, 1,000, 1,200 people that we've got on our books start to try and also answer those questions of how do we diagnose it during life. I might put a registration in for Dr. Travis Brown, uh, <laughs> but just in closing our first conversation about CTE, any final thoughts for doctors, general practitioners or, or the general community about CTE? I have a few thoughts, actually. Mm. Um, so you might regret asking that. No. But, um, <laughs> for the general community, we're walking a fine line between trying to alert people to a problem while not alarming everyone that's ever played any footy that thinking that they're going to get this disease. The messaging has to be balanced. And from what we can tell, many, many people played footy when they were young and not that many get CTE. So it's not, not something to be you know, hugely concerned about as you get older. Um, we don't want to alarm people. So that's one thing. Then I guess the other thing is for doctors, we just want it to be on all doctors' radars to start to entertain it in a differential diagnosis um, because I think that's how we're going to accelerate our understanding of the disease and understand uh, understand how to treat it. And I would encourage all doctors to take a contact sports history uh, as, as part of any standard history particularly if that person is presenting with mood issues or behavioural issues, drug and alcohol issues, suicidal things or, or cognitive issues, then it's very important to take a contact sports history. I'll let my GP know because that will be one sentence. He played soccer in primary school, headed the ball once. <laughs> <laughs> Associate Professor Michael Buckland, thank you for joining us on This Medical Life. Oh, thanks very much for having me. Associate Professor Linda Isles is Head of Forensic Pathology Services at the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine and coordinates the Institute's Neuropathology Service. Due to the Institute's partnership with the Australian Sports Brain Bank, Associate Professor Isles facilitates the management of a deceased person that may have suffered from CTE. And she's our guest on this Medical Life podcast. Welcome. Thanks, Steve, and thanks, Travis. But I wonder if you could tell us about the importance of medical autopsies, not just in relation to CTE, but, but in general. I guess you can look at autopsies, uh, at least modern-day autopsies, in, in two streams. So there's obviously the forensic uh, aspect, uh, but there's the medical uh, autopsies, which seem to be reducing in number, but are still of you know very high importance. And even the uh, forensic type autopsies that, that come under the coroner's auspices, you know, the majority of, of those are actually natural deaths. And there is immense value in that medical data in terms of uh, public health, uh, but also in, from in informing families about, A, the medical events that precipitated their loved ones, usually untimely death, uh, but also um, medical information that might 
be relevant to their own health. So, for example, here we have a, a very strong family health program so that uh, we can uh, refer families to medical specialists when we have identified something in their loved one which might be relevant to them or, or other relatives. What role does forensics play in the diagnosis of CTE? Ultimately, at, at this point in time, um, as I'm sure you've established by now, is currently brain examination and brain autopsy is the only way that CTE can be reliably diagnosed. And given the uh, number of autopsies that are done outside of the forensic or the coronial setting is, is becoming vanishingly rare, the largest source of uh, brain examinations um, is through the kind of coronial forensic system. So there is brain donation, which uh, is, is really important, um, but also we deal with clearly cases that uh, have died here and now. And particularly in the setting of deaths by suicide, um, they are, by definition, they fall under the Coroner's Act, and so they're the cases that, that come through our service. So identifying cases where CTE might have a factor in terms of someone's death, um, this is the place where it's going to happen. Um, so, and not just, I guess, suicides, but then sort of thinking about sort of recurrent head trauma and uh, particularly in the setting of family violence, kind of thinking about what CTE might mean in that space. There's a bit of research which suggests that it's not necessarily a strong association, but I don't think we have enough data about that yet. So that's also uh, important along with the suicide. At a macroscopic level, are there any visual changes that you can notice that would say, oh, this could be a patient with CTE? In really severe end-stage disease, um, you, you know, can get significant atrophic changes, uh, which um, they're not specific, but you might see that in CTE. But ultimately, uh, particularly in um, early and mid-stage, this just the brains just look normal and that's that's the difficulty and that's why we that's why it's an autopsy diagnosis because um, you need to take the right brain, brain samples and you need to do the right immunohistochemical testing in order to make the diagnosis uh, because if it wasn't the case then you know we could use medical imaging like you know, MRI for example to, to make these diagnoses but unfortunately at this point in time uh, there is no other effective way to make the diagnosis other than um autopsy brain examination and the right autopsy brain examination because it is a very in-depth and sophisticated examination and not one that we can do on all comers because it just in involves um, such a lot of brain sampling and obviously even immunohistochemical testing um, of the correct sections. Now, there is an association. I'm not sure if it's a, it's a correlation, but association with patients with CTE and suicide. Unfortunately, when I went through the Forensics Institute, I saw how many suicides actually came through, which was just staggering to me. But when would CTE come into the differential diagnosis of a patient who has uh, has died through, through suicide? It is really sobering, and that's one of the things that mm. you, um, when you come to work in a, in a place like this that has um, deals with such a high volume of deaths, the number of suicides is very, very sobering. And uh, and that makes the reality of doing extended brain examinations on all people who die by suicide really not tenable, um, not necessarily just from a resource point of view, but also from um, a family's point of view because not everyone is culturally um, happy about the idea of autopsy. They would say and quite frequently do the cause of death is obvious, um, this is unnecessary. And so it's trying to identify in which cases that there might be some underlying organic brain pathology um, that has played potentially some role. So, uh, suicide is a very kind of complex, complex issue in this. As you can imagine, there's just so many, as you understand, there's so many sort of complex interplays with mm -hmm. life events and organic disease in bits and pieces. But it's trying to identify which cases would benefit from extended brain examination and then putting it to families to say this is what we would like to do to explore this issue. But I have to say in a significant proportion of cases that we have sent for the CTE type level of examination is that families that have actually raised concerns with us. Oh. And that's really important. And that's why community awareness um, is, is really, really key for us here because you know, it's a bit of a vexed issue in terms of when a, a case gets reported to us and families are acutely grieving, uh, 
taking a very specific history about head trauma and things is is not it's a not really the role of the coronial staff here but but also families often are not ready to have that discussion at that point in time and and that is really the difficult thing uh and also we're we're quite cognizant of the ethics about sort of uh, when people are in that vulnerable kind of state kind of planting the idea of a, an issue or a pathology that might not actually be present and and so it, it's actually really quite complex, which is why we really value families raising their concerns de novo without us sort of prompting them to do that. But in saying that, you know, we've had one or two cases where we've had the police, particularly uh, in rural areas, because police kind of, you know, in, in those spaces kind of know know the community quite well, have actually said, you know, this bloke played a lot of football and I know that he had a lot of head injuries. You know, that's really helpful because I think the raised level of community awareness is responsible for, for those bits of information filtering through to us. So that's why things like what you're doing now uh, and other things, for example, the um, the event that the college uh, ran at the end of last year is, is really important to raise community awareness. You've mentioned it a few times, but I just want to clarify, what is the actual difference between a, a traditional autopsy and an autopsy that, that will look at for CTE? It depends on what you call traditional as well, which is yes. which is an interesting thing because now we uh, we have postmodern CT scanning is almost universal across Australia now. In fact, compared to other countries in the world, Australia is probably at, is at the forefront of uh, postmortem um, radiological imaging. And so, what is viewed as a traditional autopsy is 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 now changing. So, look, ultimately, I think autopsy examination. We need to use, we have the tools to do various things when it comes to investigating death and it's choosing the right tools for the right situation. That's becoming how the, the practice of, of autopsy is evolving. For example, there'll be an, uh, cases where someone has had some vague chest pain symptoms, for example, and um, then has found been found dead at home. We will go to postmodern CT, we can see that there's no obvious intracranial pathology. Uh, and then we'll proceed to do the autopsy and, and find they have uh, coronary artery thrombosis. Now, um, for us, the CT imaging of that person's head in, in combination with the symptomology and that the, and the cardiac findings, that's sufficient. And, and that's, I think, appropriate use of the, of the tools that we have at our disposal in terms of um, death investigation. Back in the day, if you didn't suspect, for example, major intracerebral pathology, you might examine the brain but take six samples of brain tissue now, those six samples would be completely inadequate to diagnose CTE. That's why if you kind of look back at historical cases, unless there's been very extensive brain sampling, then you're really just not going to have enough tissue to make a diagnosis, particularly of the earlier stages of CTE. But if you're suspecting CTE, we, we have a couple of levels of things that, that we can do here. But when families are really concerned or the history is very suggestive, we will approach the family and ask for the brain to be sent to the Australian Sports Brain Bank. That's the centre of kind of of excellence and that's where the expertise sits in Australia. So um, we will aim to do that where they will do very extensive sampling there. And then if the family is so minded, uh, they'll keep the brain as part of the donation program. That's not, they don't have to do that. We can return the brain to them um, when the diagnostic process is finished. Um, but that those are the options. Not everyone's happy with that idea because that means the brain is not going to be buried with the body at that point in time. So we have a, a kind of a middle ground where um, there is concern for CTE, but the family don't, they, they would like the brain returned to their loved one. And so what we will do here then is we will um, fix the brain for a couple of days um, take the extensive um, number of sections from the brain and have and send those up to the brain bank for testing. And I think that's a, I think it's about thirty four or thirty five blocks of brain tissue. So as opposed to the like the six, yeah. if you sort of think of that old idea of the traditional autopsy and, and brain examination. So they are quite different, and it's quite difficult to take all of those sections in an unfixed brain as well. So we need to we need to have at least a, a, a short period of fixation if if possible. Not only is that like the availability of the brain, but also from a resource point of view, um, if you kind of think about how much tissue is involved and the extensive chemical staining that needs to be undertaken, um, it's not a cheap and easy diagnosis to make. And so that's why we have to be selective about which cases we will send in that direction. Does that mean we'll miss some? Inevitably, yes, it does. Is there 
a recommended way for someone to approach consenting a family for an autopsy? The only thing I can recommend is just being completely upfront and transparent about the process. This is what it involves. This is what it will be able to tell us. This is what it may be able to tell us. And this is what it won't be able to tell us. But ultimately, there is one chance and it's now. And if you don't take that chance, then there's information that you may never have. In Victoria, which is where I'm speaking from, as in with a lot of other jurisdictions in Australia, that at least in the coronial setting and quite clearly in the hospital setting, families' views on autopsies are, can, are taken into a very high level of consideration. The coroner will be very, very reluctant to overturn a family's wishes about not having an autopsy um, and, and unless there's very significant public health issues at stake or it, there are criminal issues at stake. So we have this conversation with families very often and you know, it's a really difficult time to have that conversation. You know, it's when probably the worst thing that's ever going to happen to, to that family has just happened and it's, 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 it's such a difficult time to have such a difficult conversation. We have this problem often when it comes to infants dying, for example, and, and, and families really don't want to have an autopsy. We will explain the risks and we will try and make the consent as informed as possible if families choose not to have an autopsy. But the problem is is that they're acutely grieving and even though we explain the, implica- the, the implications of the information the autopsy can gather for, for their family and their own health, Sometimes they make that choice not to have an autopsy, but then a couple of months later we get them on the phone wanting to know more and we just can't give them more. And it's 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 just really difficult and there's no easy solution. All we can do is be as kind of forthright, open and transparent as possible and try and make the decision as informed as possible. But really hard to make an informed decision when you're in in such when you're devastated it's really 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 vexed given that sometimes in the hospital it can be really an an emotional time if a general practitioner is sitting across from a patient who may have these concerns uh is there a way that they could almost say look let's almost pre-approve a a an autopsy when that event actually happens, that you do die? Is there, is there almost a mechanism for that? It's interesting that the only real mechanism that exists is really through the Sports Brain Bank, so wow. pledging a brain to be donated. And so from time to time, we will have um, decedents who come to us because they're coronial reported cases, but they have already pre-consented to donate um, their brain. And so in those cases, um, the coroner is very happy for the brain examination to be undertaken by the ASBB. I mean, there might be a couple of circumstances where it's a homicide, for example. But in in the majority of cases, if someone has already um, pre-pledged their their brain to be donated because they have concerns about these issues, then, um, yeah, that can happen because the coroner will still get a report from the Australian Sports Brain Bank. So that means the coroner can still get the information they require for their investigation and the families will have their concerns also addressed um, by the ASBB who do a very, very thorough um, examination. When I say very thorough examination, it's not just directed, is, is this CTE or not, because there are a large number of neurodegenerative conditions that um, may, uh, CTE symptoms unfortunately aren't particularly specific. Uh, so they will still get a very thorough uh, investigation and, you know, more often than not, actually, a, a evidence of other types of neurodegenerative conditions will actually be um, discovered by the ASBB as opposed to CTE. So there's no um, there's no kind of super targeted look at CTE and forget about the rest. Um, it's actually a very kind of comprehensive investigation. Family members are worried about a loved one having CTE. How do they go about raising that? Well, it's it's interesting um, in terms of the consent process. You might have to ask Professor Buckland about because unless the, unless the decedent themselves uh, consents to donation, um, then then I don't think you can donate someone's brain without without their consent. Mm. So unless it falls under the coronial jurisdiction, it would become be quite difficult for the families to get that examination to be undertaken. And the coroner can only explore issues if they're related to that person's death. So it's it's not the coroner's jurisdiction to look into cases of because the family is interested. It has to be related to that specifically related to that person's death. So, for example, if somebody's um, 
if the family are concerned about CT or another neurodegenerative condition and their loved one dies suddenly, but it's quite clearly of a cardiac condition, for example, the letters of the coroner can't explore something that's not related to that person's death. It's not their wrong. In that situation, though, the families can uh, approach us for a private autopsy um, to examine the brain and then we'll send it to the ASBB. So that's probably a mechanism that could we could uh, that that issue could be explored. But in saying that, around Australia, the number of kind of facilities or the number of options for brain donation, unfortunately, uh, are becoming smaller and smaller, particularly when it comes to neurodegenerative condition. Just before we wind up, one quick observation: we mentioned the benefit of talking more about CTE in the general public, but it seems to me, from what you've said today, the field of medical autopsies has developed much further than the public imagination can picture. Would you be an advocate for somehow us talking more about medical autopsies within the broader community so it lessens perhaps some of that that shock when decisions need to be made? Absolutely. And and I think in today's society, sort of that sort of paternalistic kind of view of protecting people around medical procedures and what happens and what doesn't happen. I don't think there's much room for that anymore. So the, the information needs to be kind of clear and transparent uh, so people can make informed decisions. We view autopsies as extended surgical procedures. Um, they're done respectfully and they're not done unnecessarily. And as I've mentioned, we, we now have tools which enable us to do things more selectively Um, which sometimes is more acceptable to families. And so often families might not be, for example, comfortable. Examining the brain is is one, is the thing that people are least comfortable about. And so because we have a level of comfort now with post-mortem CT imaging, for example, we can say, well, we will omit that part of the examination if that makes you more comfortable with us being able to do the rest of the examination so we can provide you with the medical information that you need. An extension of that is, for example, we will be getting uh, an MRI scanner here, um, hopefully online in early 2025. And that will mean a further evolution in autopsy practice. And mm. and, and, and how we integrate that into autopsy practice is, is something that uh, remains to be seen. I'm actually really quite excited to see how, how, how that's going to evolve. Mm. Um, but that's the thing about autopsy practice and forensic practice. We have to keep evolving when new information and new technologies become applied in, in the best settings. So um, it's it's quite exciting um, and the public should be part of that conversation. Yes, well, you've helped me evolve because it's counterintuitive that the brain is the more sensitive part. I would have thought it was the other parts of the body that would have caused more concern, but there you go. Finally, Linda, any, any thoughts or advice for doctors about CTE and or autopsies? Uh, in terms of Doctors in general, it's it's really if if they do have concerns, um, particularly um, GPs, then putting that in a, a patient's medical record is really helpful for us because that will help us in terms of the the decision making and doing the right examination for the right person. I think in terms of autopsies and their value, there are two sides to this. So there's obviously doctors and families kind of consenting to autopsies, but also the onus is on us to provide the information back in a timely fashion. And so I have to say from a workload point of view, our, the turnaround time for autopsy reports can be very long. And sometimes that's a disincentive because doctors in particular, like in hospitals, for example, they move medical units. And so, you know, that information becomes lost because the the team that was looking after that patient, by the time the autopsy report comes, they're, they're, they're long gone. So I think the flip side is the, is the onus on us as autopsy practitioners to, as much as we can, and I'm very cognizant of the <laughs> issues that we have, is is that information needs to come back in a, in, a, in a timely fashion because that makes it much more useful for people. We'll keep an eagle eye forensically on that progress. <laughs> Associate Professor Linda Isles, thanks for joining this Medical Life. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Travis. This Medical Life is recorded in the Talked About Marketing studios in Adelaide. For show notes and more information about the podcast, visit thismedicallife.com.au. You can contact the hosts on social media. Dr. Travis Brown can be found on X. His username is at Dr. Travis Brown. That's D-R 
Travis Brown. And Steve Davis can be found on LinkedIn. Go to linkedin.com slash in slash the real Steve Davis. This has been a Pathnotes Proprietary Limited production. Are you a podcaster? Maybe you've got that big idea and you're looking for a network to join. The multi-award winning Ozcast Network can get your content to eyes and ears all over the world. Join now for the first month free and you could be featuring this sound at the beginning of your podcast. Ozcast. Simply head to ozcastnetwork.com for details.